So uh, let's um, start up um, the notes today. So we're up to page uh, 171. What are we talking about? Well, we've introduced this notion of probability. So if you remember, and I'm going the wrong way again, uh, if you remember what we were talking about, the main thing that we introduced yesterday was the concept of a probability, which essentially reflects the chance that, oh, this is the wrong set of notes, essentially reflects the wrong the chance that uh, a particular event can occur. So remember that underlying everything we do, we have a sample space S, uh, this curly P, which is uh, conveniently forgotten, which is the collection of events where we're, that we're interested in, and the P, the probability distribution PR, which just tells us how likely any collection of events are uh, which we are really interested in. Uh, and we got into the notion of trying to formulate this probability space in the previous example. So uh, now I'll go and find something useful. So what we were finishing up talking about was this, uh, here it is, the idea that uh, our sample space is a collection of finite, uh, countably infinite, po ca finite number of points, a, a, a1 up to ak, and p sub i was the probability that the ith event ai occurs. Okay, that's what that is. And we were talking about how we can use that combined with our probability axioms one, two, and three, and the resulting seven properties that we'd gotten from that uh, to kind of answer some questions of practical interest. And that's where we'd gotten up to at the end of yesterday. So let's uh, start. So we're on this page 171. 171 is a kind of a strange thing to do, actually, because this is the, exactly the scenario I described to you before. So we have an experiment with a state space S with a collection of outcomes A1 up to AK. These are possible outcomes, for example, flipping a coin and you have two outcomes. But in this particular scenario, we're making a special assumption that is that every possible outcome is equally likely. Okay, that is to say, as it says here in this um, purple letters, that the probability of A1 is equal to the probability of A2 and so on and so forth. They're all equally likely. And so note that because, of course, the probability of the state space is 1, that's one of our axioms, okay, then basically if we sum up all the probabilities of each of the individual components of the state space, that's that sum that you see at the bottom, then of course you get back 1. Okay, but using the condition in purple, they're all equal. So what this thing is equal to is, say, k times the probability of the first one, so that means the probability of the first one is equal to 1 over k, and that means that the probability of all of the events is 1 over k. Okay? So in this construction, because there are k events, and each of the k events in the sample space, and each of the k events are equally likely, the probability of any one event in this scenario is 1 over k. It's actually called the uniform distribution, and that's the one of the first, it is the first distribution that we have seen in this uh, class. Okay, so if in a result, so this is obviously, sometimes things aren't obvious, um, but if an experiment can result in any one of k different equally likely outcomes in this scenario, then the probability that the, an event A occurs is simply the number of sample points in that s event A over the total number of sample space, s number of points in the sample space. Okay, that is to say, let's say that, well, if there are three events in here, and there are k events in S, then the chance of uh, A occurring is 3 over k. Okay. So let's take an example. So, um, an example. So, uh, equally likely is kind of a, a very special case. Uh, so, if you flip a fair coin, uh, and the fair coin, then the probability of the head and the tail being the two outcomes of this experiment, if they're equally likely, there's only two outcomes, so the probability of their events are respectively 1 over 2. Now, if you roll a fair die, we then know that there are six possible outcomes. In those six possible outcomes, the probability of any one of those six numbers landing is 1 over 6 by this construction. So now if we introduce the event A, that the number that we roll a number greater than 4, that set is the elements 5 and 6, using precisely the principle on the previous slide that the probability of this event A is the number of components in that set divided by the total number of components in the sample space, the chance of this event is 2 over 6. Okay? And for outcomes which are not equally likely, 
Well, it's a bit strange we've already done that. In fact, we have done the general case, but okay, let's have a look at that. If we flip a biased coin with the chance of a head is twice as likely to occur as a tail, then the probability of a head, we already said this, was 2 over 3, 1 over 3 for a tail. We said that in the previous lecture, actually. It was kind of a funny example. Okay, let's have a look at example 3. Well, that was very interesting. Do we have an example 2? Maybe, oh, yes, we do. So here we have a box that has 50 bolts and 150 nuts. Half the bolts and half of the nuts are rusted. If one item is chosen at random, what is the probability that is a rusted, that it is rusted, or is a bolt? Okay. So let's characterize these two events. So we have the event A, the item is rusted, and the event B, that the item is, bolt, is a bolt. Okay, and we're asked what is the probability of A or B occurring, or equivalently, the probability of A union B. Okay, well, we have a nice equation for this. We don't know anything about the events A and B. We, we're certainly not going to be mutually exclusive because an item can be rusted and a bolt simultaneously. So, of course, they're not mutually exclusive. So, for any pair of events A and B, we have this equation. This was. Uh, one of the things that we can think is probability five of yesterday's lecture is the probability of A union B is the sum of the probabilities of A and B take away the probability of their intersection. Now, what we're doing here is we're trying now to work out the probability that the event A occurs. So that's the probability that an item is rusted. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, I've got 200 nuts and bolts in, com in, com in total. That's 50 plus 150. So that's my denominator here. And the total number of items that are rusted, well, that's half of the bolts and half of the nuts. So that's 100 items, okay? So the probability that an item is rusted by our formulation is 100 over 200 or 1 over 2. Okay. Now, what's the probability of B, the probability that the item is a bolt? Well, again, I have 200 items, okay, and I have 50 bolts. 50 bolts. So 50 over 200, over 1 over 4. Now, what's the probability that an item is a nut, uh, sorry, is a, is a bolt and it is rusted? Okay, so again, I have 200 items. Okay, um, there are 50 bolts and half of them are rusted, so there are 25 rusted bolts. Okay, so that's 25 over 200. Okay, then if you plug those numbers into this series of equations and work out the result it's 5 over 8 okay very good let's have a look so we have a lot of examples i mean it's going to become tiresome but at least at the end we'll understand this concept so now you have two fair dice you roll them what's the probability that the sum of the upturned faces will equal 8 Okay, so we want to compute the probability of the set A, where A is the event, the sum of the upturned faces is 8. Okay, so what are the scenarios in which this could occur? Okay, so I could roll a 2 and a 6, I could roll a 3 and a 5, I could roll a 4 and a 4, a 5 and a 3, 6 and a 2. Okay, we can add those numbers together and get 8 in every scenario. Okay, so now what are the total number of outcomes of the sum of the scores of the die? Well, there are 36 possible so each outcome sorry, is equally likely with probability 1 over 36, okay? And we have five possible outcomes in this set. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the probability of A will be following this um, scenario is 5 over 36. So 36 possible outcomes and five of them are where our set is occurring, okay? So again, that's just an application of that principle that we discussed at the beginning of these examples. Okay, so example five. So here we have uh, we have an urn, okay, for bo or a box, if you prefer, if it makes more sense to you. It contains six w uh, white balls and five black balls, and I take two balls out of that at one go. Okay. Now the question asks us, what is the probability that one of the drawn balls is white and the other one is black? Okay. So this one is this combinatorial stuff that we discussed at the end of last week. So what are the number of elements in the sample space? What are the all, all the possible outcomes? Well, in this case, remember, we've got 11 balls, and I'm going to choose two of them at the same time. So and I don't care about the ordering, right? So the, the total number of combinations of these two balls 
is going to be the number of items 11 choose 2. Okay, that's what this one, 11 choose 2. So that's 11 factorial over 9 factorial multiplied by 1 over 2 factorial. Okay, which gives you this. It's 55. Okay, so now what we have to do is we want to work out how many sample points that have one white and one black ball. Okay, so first of all, if I think, I forget which one is the right number, sorry. So there are six white balls. Okay, so now if I want to draw one of those white balls, the number of white balls I could draw in this sample would be six choose one, right? Because there's six possible balls, and I want to take one of them. Okay, simultaneously, I want to get one black ball, and there are five black balls, so there are five choose one possible black balls I could choose. It's actually just six times five. You don't need to do combinations here. That six times five is 30. Okay, so that's 30 possible uh, scenarios or combinations of choosing one white and one black. Okay, and so the probability of the event is the total number of elements in our set, our set being the case of choosing a black and a white ball simultaneously, divided by the total number of outcomes, which is 55. So the result, 30 over 55. Very good. Okay. Example six is, again, it's pretty much the same question almost, except it's uh, about poker. So you have a poker hand. Poker hand is five cards, if you don't know that. Sometimes people don't know these things. Let's find the probability of holding two aces and two jacks. Okay, so again, the first thing to do, we want to work out what are the total number of hands I could have in a poker, in, a, in my poker hand. Okay, so the number of possible outcomes of drawing five cards from 52, playing deck is 52 cards, is 52 choose five. Okay, that's what this one says here. Okay, 52 choose five is a big number. You can see it there, it's 2.5 million. A bit more than that. Okay, so that's the total number of outcomes. Now we want to work out the number of outcomes in which our event actually occurs. So now we want to have two ices, ices, aces and three jacks. Okay, so how do we get that? It's kind of confusing this last term, we don't really need it. So I want to have two aces, so I've got four choose two possible aces I could choose. Okay, and I want two jacks, right? There are four jacks and I draw three of them and I can have any three of them, so that's four choose through, three, excuse me, this one is one, it doesn't matter. So basically it's this number multiplied by this number. So that's the total number of hands that you can get where you have two aces and two jacks. Okay, because there are four aces and th four jacks. Okay, so that's 24. So the probability of, of uh, that there are two aces and three jacks in a poker hand, if basically drawing cards are always equally likely to receive any card, is this number here is very small. Okay, so this is just, just an application of the same principle. So the third example, okay, so they're, they're pretty much the same question again and again, but okay, so you have three books, and they're picked at random from a shelf. That has five novels, three poem, books of poems, and a dictionary. Okay, and we're asked two questions. First of all, what's the probability that the dictionary is selected, and the second part, which we'll come to when we get there. Let's do the first part first. Okay. So first of all, what are the number of possible selections of three books? Okay, so I've got nine books in total, right? Uh, what, however many there were, let's remind ourselves. Okay, so it's five plus, uh, five plus three plus one. Okay, so that's nine books, and I choose three of them. So it's nine choose three possible selection of three books from the shelf. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to select a dictionary. Remember, there's only one dictionary and then two other books. Okay, and I don't care what they are. Okay, so there's only one way to get a dictionary. And then for the resulting books, I've got eight books left over. And the two, I can choose any two of them. I don't care what they are. So that's eight choose two. That's where I get that from. So the total number of ways in which I can choose a dictionary and two other books is going to be 28. It's just this number multiplied by this number. Okay, so the, the probability that a dictionary is selected is basically, as we say before, the number of ways that this event can occur, 28, divided by the total number of events that could occur, 88, because in, in the case that drawing a book is equally likely, so that happens to be 1 over 3. Okay, part B. Now what do I want to do? I want to select two novels and one book of poems. Okay, it's, almost, it's a very similar question, actually. 
Okay, so again, we know in, in this question, we already know the, the denominator. We know the, the uh, total number of possible selections of three books. So we just have to work out this event uh, that we have before. Okay, so now what do I want to do? I want to choose one book of poems. Okay, well, there are three books of poems, if you remember, so I get three choose one. I want to choose two novels at the same time, so I get uh, five novels, choose two. That's five, choose two. This is a kind of confusing factor. It doesn't mean anything, actually. So it's just this one times this one, and that's 30. It's not very, it's, it's, it's basically that. And so then the required probability is 30 over the previous number of the total number of, hand, uh, total number of uh, combinations of books I can get, which was 84, and so that becomes five over 14. Okay, number eight. So number eight, example eight, at least makes us think for a moment. The, the last few questions are kind of, well, I know how to do a little bit about combinatorics, and I've got my formula for the probability of A in this case. So this one says a professor hands out a list of ten topics. Five are going to be on the test, okay, and a student's got to take that exam, but they only have enough time to prepare for seven of those things. So there is a chance that they get to the exam and uh, they don't know some of the topics. Now, the professor chooses five topics at random. He, he, he or she does not care which one he, he or she sets. He's just going to just choose them equally likely. Okay, so at random, if you're wondering, is an exchangeable phrase for equally likely. Okay, then what is the probability that the student will be prepared for? And there are three scenarios. Let's th start with the first one. So the first one says, what's the chance that they, what is the probability that they are going to be prepared for f all of the topics that appear in the test? Okay, and logic tells you that's probably not going to be so likely, but let's find out what that is. Okay, this looks like a lot of work to understand it, but it's not too bad. So, uh, first of all, let's start with the size of the sample space. Okay, so the set that I'm interested in is the set that, that the student is prepared for all of those five topics. Okay, and I want to can work out the probability of A. So now the number of elements in the state space S, right, well, that's the number of questions that the student can get right, or the, the, the number of topics that are chosen. So there are 10 top topics, and uh, five of them are chosen. So there's 10 choose five possible uh, combinations uh, that can occur. Quite a lot, actually. Right, now, what's the, what's the number of wh scenarios where the, the person is ready for all those five, right? So they prepare for seven of the topics and I have to get all of those five so there are seven choose five possible ways of basically uh, basically having that happen okay so the total the probability that the student is ready for all of those scenarios is just the cardinality of this state space a the set a divided by the cardinality of the set s Okay, so which is this number here, you don't care about this one, this is 1, okay, so that's that one here, divided by this one here, and it happens to be 1 over 12. Okay, now B at least makes us think, I think it's more interesting, at least most, the mo more interesting of the three questions. Now the question is, I'm asked, what's the probability that the student is prepared for less than three topics? Now let's think about this, they prepared for seven, they're going to be five, right? So it's impossible that all five of the topics are not be, have not been prepared for. It can't happen, right? Because five of them, um, he's, he or she is prepared for seven of the things, right? So if he prepared for three, so could it be that they have more than... It, it basically, it couldn't be that the, the student has is unprepared for two, or zero, one, or two. It can't happen. It, uh, zero or one, right? It could be the case that there are two that there's not prepared for, and it could be three or four, uh, is prepared for four. So basically there are two questions, and uh, the worst case is basically that, that, uh, that they have uh, two questions. So the B is the, the cardinality that they're prepared for less than three topics in the test. Okay, so that means again, seven choose t two of the questions are Two of the questions that he has revised for, she's revised for, come up, and there's seven choose two ways that that could happen. And then the other three questions, well, there's only one way that they could be uh, coming in. 
okay and so the probability so it can't be you you can't take it so you the, 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 there can't be the case that there's one or zero that's what i'm trying to say so that's why you only get this, this particular particular case it's not you don't take in the case zero or one or two but zero or one can't happen okay so the probability of b is then just basically this result here which is the cardinality of the state space b okay divided by the cardinality of the sample space space s Okay, now part C is not that difficult because it's now exactly four topics. And in fact, the answer to this one is almost identical to this one because basically what we did in part B is to work out the, ch the, the chance of exactly two topics, right? Because as I said, zero and one can't occur. Okay, so the, 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 if we denote the set C by the event that the individual is prepared for exactly four topics in the test, what that means is of the seven topics that he or she is prepared for, four of them come along, right? And then I have three choose one possible ways uh, of the result, a resulting one that I don't have. So I've got three topics left over. That one, it comes along, and there are three of them, three of those questions that could come along. Okay, so this is seven choose four. This one is three choose one. Okay, and again, the probability of C is just basically this one divided by the size of the state space s and so if you just do some simple calculations you get 5 over 12 okay so b and c are very similar uh, c uh, b because of the constraints that are imposed by the question okay question 9 so question example 9 so there are a lot of examples i think you should understand these things at the end we hope Okay, so example nine. So we have 200 students, 108 study economics, 138 study uh, chemistry, and uh, 70 study them both. Okay, now what we're saying is that basically if I select a student, student uniformly at random, again that means it's equally likely to choose any student that I want, what is the probability of these three events? So let's try taking, think about A, B, and C. So A is the probability that the student takes economics or history. So I think you can see where the part A is going to be. So E is the event that the student takes economics. C is the event that the student takes chemistry. Okay, so now we have some information available to us. Excuse me. The probability of the event E, well, what's that? Well, there are 200 students, so I have 108 over 200 students is the probability of E. The probability of C, we'll have 138 students which take chemistry over 200 and the probability of E and C which is the number of students that take economics and chemistry divided by 200 so now I have this information available to me I haven't solved any of the question yet so the question a says that the probability that the individual takes economics or chemistry so that's the probability that I take E or C okay the probability that I take E or C is again by property 5 the probability of E plus the probability of C minus the intersection, okay? And those three quantities are precisely calculated in this, this thing here, okay? So the answer is 0 0.88. Okay, part B. So part B, that the student doesn't take either, neither is not the correct English, it doesn't make sense, doesn't take either of these subjects. So they do not take economics or chemistry. So what am I want to compute here? I want to compute the probability of E or C, but I want to take the complement. So just taking into account, that's the complement. Okay, that's, the, that's what I want to compute. Well, what do I know? I know that the probability of the complement of a set is one minus the probability itself. So this, this, the probability of this event is precisely one minus the probability of E or C. Okay, and the probability of E or C is exactly what we computed in the previous part. That's 0.88, so this is 0.12. Okay, very good. So the final question the individual we want to work out is that the individual, that at the student that you've chosen at random takes chemistry, but they don't take economics. Okay, very good. Okay, now there's going to be, we're going to introduce an identity here. So you're going to see an identity. I'm going to explain it in a moment. But you're going to, it's important to, to well, to memorize it, maybe not, but to keep it in mind because it's going to come back in the rest later in the lecture. Okay, so we start with something which looks abstract. Okay, so remember that what we want to do, 
right? Again, we just remind ourselves, they take uh, chemistry but not ep economics. So what I want to calculate is the probability of C and E complement. Okay, and it's not obvious how to compute that actually. But let's think about this. So now we know that the event C, so we've seen this at least, we saw it in our first lecture, we, saw, we talked about it yesterday, except with A and B that the event C is E complement and C union E, com e and C. Okay, we saw that that's one of our properties of sets. Okay, and we know that the intersection of these two sets is empty, right? E and C and E and C, sorry, E complement and C and E and C is empty, right? Because E and E complement cannot occur simultaneously. So what does that mean? That means the probability of this event C is equal to the probability of this plus the probability of this. Why is that the case? Because those two events that I've just mentioned are mutually exclusive, i.e. that their intersection is empty. Okay, well does that solve my question? Not quite, because what I want to compute is the probability of E complement and C. So I can take this expression, the probability of E and C to the other side, and so now the thing that I want to compute, the probability of E complement and C, is just the difference between the probability in C and the probability of E and C. Okay, well, why is, that, why is that good? Well, I know the probability of C, that's this thing here, and the probability of E and C, I know it, it's this one here. And so basically, if I plug those two numbers in, uh, I will get 0.34. Okay, so just keep this one in mind, right? We're going to use something similar to this later on, I hope. Very good. So hopefully that there was eight or nine examples, something like that. And that brings us to something which is a very important concept, which is the notion of conditional probability. Okay, and what does it mean? Well, you can read the stuff here. I'm just going to say what the intuition is. I want to know if... Conditional on something already happened, what is the probability of something else happening? Okay, that's the basic context. If we read the slide, basically, we want to compute probabilities with access to some partial information concerning the result of the experiment. Okay, so basically, the idea is the following. Okay, I have two events, A and B, and that's associated to our experiment, E, or our, 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 um, yeah, our experiment. And I'm going to use this notation, we're going to use this notation, the probability that A occurs given that B has already occurred. So it's called, so this uh, object, PRA uh, vertical line B, okay, it means the probability that A occurs given that B has already occurred, okay. Now, how do we calculate it? How do we do things with it? Well, that's going to follow in a moment, but it's just important to understand what does the notation means, okay? So, this is the thing I'm making an uncertainty statement about. This is the thing that has already happened, okay? And this is what I'm trying to kind of construct. Now, let's construct this by example. I think that's the way we proceed. Okay, here's an example. So, it's a lot of things on this slide, but you have two fair die. You, you roll them, and the outcome is re recorded, and you get a number x1 and x2. So what does x1 represent? That represents the score of the first die, and x2 represents the score of the second die. Okay, so x1 could be a number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. x2 could be a number 1, 2, 3, 5, 6. So the sample, sample space in this case, okay, well, we've seen this a lot of times. There's 36 elements. There's one, one, there's one, two, there's one, three, and all the way up to six and six. 36 possible uh, outcomes. Okay, let's introduce a set. So we introduce the set A, which is X1 and X2. Okay, so that's the score of the dice on roll one and roll two. And that's such that the sum of X1 and X2 is equal to 10. Okay, so that means I roll dice one, I roll dice two, and I add the two totals together and I get 10. And there's basically three scenarios where that happens. I get a five and a five, I get a four and a six, and I get a six and a four. So this state space has cardinality three. Okay, now if I introduce a set B, which is this, the collection of scores on the dice, X1 and X2, such that the first roll score is higher than the second score, than the second one, okay? 
So that has more elements. Because, so for example, I could get a 2 and a 1, or I can get a 3 and a 1 and a 3 and a 2, or I could get a 4 and a 1, 4 and a 2, 4 and a 3, and you know how, how that goes. And you finally get to the case where you roll a 6 and a 5. It's strictly greater than, so of course I can only get, I can't get 6, 6, for instance. <coughs> okay, so if you work, if you write down all of those possible uh, events or uh, occurrences, that has 15 events in there, okay? So the size of the state space, well, there are 36 possible elements, 36 possible scores. There are three elements in A, there are three, uh, 15 elements in B. So all outcomes are equally likely because we're rolling fair die. And the probability that A occurs is, of course, 3 over 36. The probability that B occurs is 15 over 36, or if you prefer, 5 over 12. Okay, that's very exciting. But that doesn't help us with our concept yet. Suppose now that we know the outcome satisfies x1 is greater than x2. Okay, I know that. I tell you I know that. How do I know that I know it? What is the probability that x1 and x2 added together is 10? Okay, that's the question that we're asking ourselves. So that is, I know this one has occurred. What is the chance that this occurs? Okay, I have some extra information. Before I just rolled the dice, I didn't know anything. I could just uh, jump around and whatever. But now I have this information. And I'm asking the question, what's the probability that A occurs given B? Okay, so let's think about e this even more. Since the B has occurred, instead of s considering the set of all possible outcomes, we consider the set of sample points for B. Okay, because we already know x1 is bigger than x2. So now we basically find out all the elements of A and B. Okay, this I don't know if this red, the red sentence may help work things out. So the conditional probability of A and B can be, can, can, be con can be obtained by the number of elements in A and B occurring simultaneously divided by the number of elements in B. Or if you prefer, if I divide by the number of elements in S and the, and the numerator and the denominator, in this particular scenario, it basically becomes the probability of A and B over the probability of B. Okay, and if you want to interchange the roles of A and B, I can get this one as well. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that the intersection of A and B is the set 6-4. Okay, have we forgotten what A and B is? Yes, we have. I have anyway. So A and A is this set 5-5-4-6-6-4, five, five, six, six, and B is the set where the, the collection of values x1 and x2, uh, x1 is bigger than x2. Okay, so in this one, if I look at here, this is the only element in this set A for which... Um, the first one is bigger than the second one. So the number of elements in A and B is 1. The number of elements in B was 15. So the probability that A occurs given B is 15. Okay, similarly the probability of A and A given B given A is the number of elements in A and B over the number of elements in A is 1 over 3. Okay. Well, I mean, is it really true? Let's think about it. Is it in fact, the definition is exactly that. I don't know if that's helped you, that intuition. I prefer to start with a definition because then I don't have to think about special cases. So it's a definition. Again, given two events, A and B, the probability here that B occurs, given that A occurs, is defined to be the probability that A occurs and B occurs, an event we already understand, over the probability of A under a specific proviso. A has to be possible. The probability of A must be non-zero, I strictly bigger than zero. Okay. If I remove this thing, okay, the definition is not correct because in mathematics, we're, well, we can, but you can't divide by zero. Okay. So you must, if you're ever asked to this definition, I'm sure you will be one day, if it's not by me, by somebody else, that you must include that condition, because it's not true otherwise. Okay, and what it means, it, it means exactly, I've only said it two or three times already, the probability of B given A is the probability that B occurs given the partial information that A has already occurred. I already know it's happened, and now I want to work out what's happening to B. Okay, let's make some remarks. I think that there are some examples here, I think, which are pretty illuminating. So 
So the first remark, you fix the set A, okay? A throughout is fixed. I'm not changing that, I'm not doing anything about it with that. Then we have the following postulates of probability, they're axioms, okay? The following, so remember we had axiom one, axiom two, axiom three for probability satisfied by, for example, the probability distribution, exactly, that's exactly what it is, it did. They are also the case for conditional probabilities. Conditional probabilities satisfy them as well. Okay, that is to say, again, if you give me A, it's fixed. The probability that B occurs, given it that you've given me A, is at most one and is at least zero. There are no negative probabilities. There is no probability which exceeds one. You cannot have that under our rules. Okay, we're making the rules, not as we go along, but that's what we're going to, to uh, do. Part two, the probability of S given A is equal to one. Why is that the case? Well, I can tell you very fast. Why is that the case? The probability of S given A is the probability of S and A over the probability of A, assuming the probability of A has positive probability. What's the probability of S and A? Well, that's the probability of A, because the intersection of the sample space with A is A. So the re this ratio becomes the probability of A over the probability of A is equal to 1. So that follows from the definition. Indeed, indeed, so would the second one. So would the first one. Okay? And the last axiom uh, is also su satisfied. Again, you can check these if you want. It's actually not very hard to check these, but I think it's, it's rather more important that you know this is true rather than you can establish it, but I think you should be able to establish it given what we have learned so far. So what does it say? So now I take a sequence of sets B1, B2, B3, off to B4, off to infinity, countably infinite, okay? Keeps on going. They're mutually exclusive. That means that I take the intersection with BI and BJ for I not equal to J, I get back the empty set. Remember, that's exactly what it says there. Okay, then remember that we have this uh, additivity property. It's called countable additivity, actually. The probability of the union of these BIs, okay, given that A is occurred, A is fixed, is the same as the sum of the probability, conditional probabilities. This is still holding. So remember, if you, if you recall yesterday's lecture, the only difference is that we didn't have this conditioning sign, and that was the third axiom of probability. It's also satisfied for conditional probabilities. Okay, and so as a remark, obviously, if uh, you have just one and two, B1 and B2, you can also have the finite, uh, uh, finite truncation of uh, axiom three. Again, it's the proof is identical almost to what we did uh, yesterday. Okay, let's have a look at an example. So example one, so we're gonna roll two balanced die. Okay, they're fair dice, I think that's what that means. Suppose that the first die is a three. What is the probability that the sum of the two dice equals eight? Okay, so this is an example, it's more practical because uh, this is something you might ask yourself if you're doing some sort of gambling or something like that, not that I'm condoning gambling, but I'm just saying you roll the dice one, the first one, I get a three, I know the chance I can get an eight, it's always possible, I want to know the chance that, it, when I say eight, I know I can get the sum of the two equal to eight, I want to know the chance is that, right? Because I may be doing, so I'm betting is not a good example, but you know what I mean, something like that. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to formulate this event in terms of sets, okay? So we introduce this event A, okay? And so A is three, okay? That's our first roll of the dice. I think we got a three first of all. Is it a three or a two? It's a three. Okay, and then this is point Y. Now this point Y is going to be the score of the second dice. But we don't know what it is yet. It's going to have a number which could be, I mean, this is a bit, it should, this is actually not correct, technically. It should be Y is in the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Because if I, this, this set actually says that I can have Y is 3.2, which is obviously not an element of what we care about. So just keep in mind that what we're supposed to be written here is that Y is in the discrete set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. Okay, now we introduce this event B. Okay, now the event B represents the chance, or the, sorry, the event that the score of the first die plus the second die added together is eight. Okay, so that could be two, six, three, five, four, four, five, three, six, two. 
Okay, it doesn't matter the order apparently. The event that the sum of oh, sorry the sum this the advice the event that the sum of the two dice equals a yes. Now what uh, what do I know? Well, I know the intersection of a and b. Okay, is only the case three and five. Okay, I rolled a three first of all. Now the sum in order to get an 8, I can only get one outcome, 5. If I don't get that, I've got no chance. So the conditional probability of B given A. Okay. So what's the probability of A and B occurring? Okay. The probability of A and B occurring is the number of elements in this set, 1, divided by the total number of elements, 36. 1 over 36. What's the probability of A occurring? Well, A has cardinality 6, right? Again, just mentioning that this is not quite correct. There are only six possible events here. 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 3, 4, 3, 5, 3, 6. So basically, this is cardinality of this one is uh, 6. So I get 6 over 36. Okay, and then basically, the 1 over 36 cancels. So I get 1 over 6 as the conditional probability of B given A. Uh, B given A. Okay, and that's what I wanted to compute. The probability that the sum of the two die is precisely eight. Okay, let's have a look at example two. Okay, I think we just have time for this before our break. So we roll an unbalanced die. I guess what that means is that the there are chances it's loaded, right? So there's a chance of certain events being are unequal. Okay, so the sample space is still one, two, three, four, five, six. It's just now that uh, someone is playing a game with us and that the chances of respective scores are now different. So in this case, the probability of 1 is defined to be 1 over 12, the probability of 2 is 1 over 12, the probability of the 3 is 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 6, 1 over 3, right? And so it's loaded, so we're very much more likely to get a 6 than any other score, okay? And as the note says, you, if you want, you can add those numbers together and they have to be equal to 1, otherwise this doesn't make any sense, okay? It doesn't make any sense because the probability of the sample space is not equal to 1. Okay, now we ask ourselves two questions. Let's see if we can get through at least part A. If the number obtained is even, what is the probability that it was a 6? Okay. So we're given this part of very strange information. Someone tells us, so oh, it's an even number, right? Now, I know it's even, but of course that means it could be 2, 4, or 6. But I want to know the chance it's a 6, given I know it's even. Okay, we'll look at B in a moment. Okay, so A is the event that the number obtained is even, so that's 2, 4, 6. So there are three elements there. Okay, but now note that we are not using this idea. So I mistaken said, well, there are three elements. The chance of that is going to be 3 over Six is not true because we have a loaded die. So remember the probability of this event A now is the sum of the probability that A is a two plus the probability that A is a four plus the probability that A is a six. Okay, that comes basically from our finite state space uh, formulation for probability. We saw that yesterday. So that's one over 12 plus one over six plus one over three. Okay, that's seven over 12. Okay, now B is the set six because I want to roll. A, I want to know the chance that the score was a six given that I got an even number. And so the intersection of the set A and the set B is just the element six. Okay, so the probability that I get a six, uh, the probability of A and B is the probability that I get a six, oh, sorry. The probability that I get a six is one over three. Okay, that's what we said on the previous slide. So now I want to compute, I'm asked to find the probability that B occurs given A occurs, and that's the probability of A and B over the probability of A, so that's equal to 1 over 3 over 7 over 12, which is equal to 4 over 7. Okay. Let's, uh, let's do part C, that's a convenient place to stop. Uh, part B, sorry. So now we're asked, what is the probability that the number obtained is a perfect square number given that number greater than three has been obtained. Okay, that's, very, uh, that's a unique one. Okay, so C is the event that the number is greater than three. So I'm conditioning on C having occurred. Okay, so D is the perfect square number, so that's one and four, right? Perfect square is one and four. 
So now what am I doing? I'm repeating the exercise. So the intersection of C and D is the set four, right? I get four is the only uh, element common between C, the set C and D. So the probability that C occurs, oh, sorry, the probability, oh yes, okay, so that's true. Uh, the probability that C occurs is the probability of four plus the probability of five plus probability of six, which is a sixth plus a sixth plus a third, that's two over three. The probability of C and D is the probability that I get four, which is one over six. Now, I know the probability that D given C is the probability of C and D over the probability of C, which is one over six, which is this one, divided by uh, two over three, which is this one, it's one over four. Okay, let's have a break now. So we'll break for five minutes. So we'll return at uh, 14.50. Thank you. Okay, so let's resume. So um, just a couple of examples more, and then uh, we're going to go on to some more stuff. It's actually pretty, uh, it's pretty, uh, quite a nice uh, pace, actually. So this example, so a couple has two children. And uh, what's the probability that both of the children are boys if you know that at least one is a son? Okay, so this, well, it sounds very obvious question, but uh, it's actually quite a neat one. And I like the formulation, it's a nice solution. So uh, let's suppose uh, that it's equally likely that you can get a boy or a girl, okay? We have to make an assumption here because we're not told anything, okay? And this is typically what one has to do in statistics. You have to make some assumption or approximation of real life, and this is a simple one to make. In fact, it's not quite true. I think it depends on the country and so forth, but it doesn't matter here. Okay, now we introduce the event, E, that both of the children are boys, and we now introduce the event F, which is the event that at least one is a son. Okay, so then the event E is, of course, the set BB, so I get a boy and a boy. F is the set boy, girl, girl, boy, boy, boy. Okay, here the order matters, actually, because... This is the first born, this is the second born, this is the first, uh, first born, second born, this first second born. So the union, sorry, the union, the intersection of the set E and F is, of course, BB, okay? So the number of elements of E and F, so here it's equally likely, right? So we go back to our equally likely formulation. So the number of events in E and F is one, the number of events in F is uh, three. So I get one over three as the probability of E and F. Okay, by the way, this doesn't tell you that the son is younger or older. We just know one of them is either younger or older. I don't know which one, but um, I know it is one of them. Okay, that's why you have three in F. Okay, example four. Example four, okay, so this one is a little bit dry. Um, the probability that a regularly scheduled flight departs on time is 0.83. Okay, pretty reasonable for many airports. The probability that it arrives on time is 0.82. Okay, and the probability that it departs and arrives on time is 0.78. Okay, so we, we formulate is this the event D, this is the event A, and this is the event D and A. Okay, this one's a little bit tedious. It says find the probability that the uh, plane arrives on time given that it departed on time. So I want to compute the probability of A given D. Okay, well we know this, this one's simple, we have a formula for it. We have the probability of A and uh, given D is the probability that A and D occurs, so, sorry, divided by the probability of D. The probability of D and A, well we know that's 0 0.78. Okay, that's the number here. The probability that D occurs is 0.83. I compute the ratio, and that's 0.9398, apparently. Okay, so that's a f kind of sensible answer, we would think. Okay, the following data were obtained in a study. In fact, this is getting a little bit closer to what statisticians would be doing. We're still doing probability, in fact. So you have um, non-smokers, you have moderate smokers, and you have heavy smokers. I don't know how you measure that, and I've never smoked in my life. And then you have people who are judged to have hypertension, no hypertension, okay? So, of course, this is, uh, so the number of non-smokers and hypertension is 21. The number of non-smokers and no hypertension is 48. And we have the column and row total. So this one, 69 is the sum of these two numbers. This one is the sum of these three numbers, okay? And these are just numbers, uh, and basically we're going to use them to compute probabilities and answer some questions. 
uh, which are of relevance in a health study. So now one of the individuals is selected completely at random and we're asked three questions. The first one, experiencing what's the probability that they exper experience hypertension? Okay, and then we're going to ask some more interesting questions. So let's start with A. Okay. So let H denote the events that the selected person experiences hypertension and doesn't, and no hypertension. So H, and this is H complement. Okay. So there are 180 people, 87 of them with hypertension. How do we know that? Well, that's the, that column. Okay, the total number of people is 180. These, this sum and this sum must be equal, otherwise something funny is going on. Okay, right. So that's that. So there are 180 people, 87 of them have hypertension. So the probability that an individual has hypertension is 87 over 180. Okay. Out of 180, 180 people, 90 of them don't have hypertension. So the probability of H is complement is of course 93 over 180 if you want you can do 1 minus this one is the same thing okay so with the probability of h in fact that's where we could have stopped there we have h complement presumably we're going to use it in a moment okay part b what's the probability that a person who currently experiences hypertension uh, the probability that they experience hypertension given that that person is a heavy smoker Okay, so that's at least a relevant question one might ask in practice, finally. Okay, so now we introduce the event A. Uh, that's the event that the selected person is a heavy smoker. Okay, now we know what? We know there are 49 heavy smokers amongst 180 people. How do we know that? Well, this is the number of heavy smokers. 30 plus 19 is 49. Okay, then there's 180 people in this study. Okay, so the probability that an individual is a heavy smoker is equally likely, remember, so I'm picking out 49 people and I divide that by 180. That's my uh, principle that we started the lecture with. So also, there are 30 heavy smokers that they have hypertension. So again, where am I getting these numbers from? I'm giving it from here. 30 individuals that have, uh, who smoke heavily and have hypertension. Okay, sorry. So... Uh, the probability that H and A can can happens at the same time is this cardinality of the number of individuals that, uh, that we have hypertension and heavy smokers, 30 divided by the total number, 180. So what do I want to compute? I want to compute the probability that that individual that I've chosen at random has hypertension given that they're a heavy smoker. And that's the probability that they have hypertension and they're a heavy smoker over the probability that I've picked someone who has who is a heavy smoker. So the probability of H and A, that's 30 over 180, okay? The probability that A occurs, that's 49 over 180. Okay, now I compute the ratio, so these 180s cancel and I get 30 over 49. Okay, very good. Now, part C. What's the probability that I chose a person at random who was a non-smoker, given that the person is exp exp ex not experiencing it's experiencing no hypertension. So I pick this person. I know that they don't have hypertension. Are they a no? What's the chance that they might be a non-smoker? Okay. So now we introduce the event B. Okay. I'm just reading the top of this slide. Uh, the event uh, that the selected person is a non-smoker. Okay. So again, there are 48 non-smokers. Why do I know that? Well, you can have a look here. Non-smokers. 48, really. Uh, 48 non-smokers with, no, with, with no hypertension. There are 49, 49 heavy smokers among 180. Uh, sorry, we know. There are 48 non-smokers with no hypertension among the 180 people. So the probability that B occurs and H complement occurs is, remember H complement is that they don't have hypertension, is 48 over 180. We already know in part A, although we never needed to compute it, that the probability of H complement is 93 over 180. So now what I want to compute is the probability that the event is a non-smoker given that they do not have hypertension. Okay, that's probability of B given H complement. And again, just using our formula, the probability of B and H complement over the probability of H complement, H complement has a non-zero probability. 
So that's 93 over 180, 48 over 180. The ratio gives us 48 over 93, and you can reduce that further if you want to. So that's 68, 16 over 31. Okay, very good. So, example six. For married couples living in a certain district, the probability that the ho husband... Actually, I didn't read this before it came. That's why I'm strange. It looks strange to me, but anyway. The probability that a husband will vote in a referendum is 0.21. Okay, that's quite relevant for if you live in the UK from Brexit. The probability that his wife w will vote is 0 0.8. The probability that they both vote is 0 0.15. And we're asked three questions. Let's start with the first one. What's the probability that at least one member of that married couple will vote? Or a particular married couple will vote. Okay, so we introduce the event H, that the husband votes, and W represents the event that the wife votes. So we're now told the probability that the husband votes is 0 0.21, and we're given the probability that the wife votes is 0 0.28. Okay, and we're also given the probability that they, that they both vote is 0 0.15. Okay, these are given to us. We don't have to do anything. Okay, so now what we're asking, asked, sorry, in part A, is the probability at least one member of the uh, married couple votes. So that's probability of H union W. Oh, sorry. Okay, so the probability of H union W, oh yeah, I did read this, the probability of H plus the probability of W minus the intersection. Okay, that's our pro point, uh, probability five from yesterday's lecture. Okay, so I put my numbers in, 0 0.21, 0 0.28, minus 0 0.15, and I get 0 0.34. Okay, very good. Right, part B. Part B asks us, the vote, the, sorry, the, the probability that the wife will, a, a given wife will vote given that our husband votes. Okay, so some sort of peer pressure here. Okay, part B. So I want to compute the probability of W given H. Okay, so that's the probability that they both vote, H and W, over the probability that the husband votes. So we know these numbers. I have 0.21, I put it here. I have the probability of husband and wife, that's 0.15. I compute the ratio and I get 5 over 7. Okay, that's part B. So part C. Now part C says, what's the probability that a given husband will vote given that his wife does not vote? Okay, so the does not is in a blue, light blue. Okay, this one. Okay, so what's the event we want to compute? I want to compute the probability that the husband votes given the wife does not vote is the probability that the husband and the, the husband votes and the wife does not vote over the probability that the wife does not vote. vote. Okay, right. Now this looks a bit more problematic because I seemingly do not know this event. I don't know the, the probability of this event occurring. Now you might remember me blabbing on about something we have to remember and that's the thing we're going to do here. So there you look at this formula. So the, d d this one is kind of okay. I know the probability that the wi wife votes so I know the probability the wife doesn't vote because that's one minus the probability the wife votes. Or if you're not listening to me it's just this expression here. Okay. So this denominator is kind of easy. It makes sense. It, it exists because it's not zero in our example. But this one is not so clear. But remember, uh, remember, I said something. Well, I'm going to find the page if I can. Um, that I was telling you about this thing. So remember that basically I was saying I look at the probability of C is equal to the probability of E complement in C plus the probability of E in C. So if I re rearrange, I can get this. Okay, and this is the formula that we used just almost an hour ago, and we're going to reuse this. Of course, E and C are, related, uh, are replaced by H and W, but uh, that's the same formula. Okay, so if you're wondering, if you're confused, you don't understand, that's just basically something we did uh, moments ago. Okay, so that's the formula you use here. Now, I know the probability of H, I know the probability of H and W, so now I know the probability of H and W complement. Okay, I just substitute them in, and I get 1 over 12. Okay, he's done the justification here, actually, but we did it already, so I don't see why we do it twice. Okay, it's exactly what we just did. Very good. Whew, example seven. So, example seven. So we have a statistics professor, apparently, and he's going to teach, he or she is going to teach in both the morning and 
afternoon sections of an introductory statistics course. I think my colleague has uh, got bored one day and decided to write this uh, question up. Um, so, uh, A is the event that the professor gives a bad morning lecture, and B is the event that the professor gives a bad afternoon lecture. And we're given these following things. The chances, apparently, this guy is relative or, or per, girl is relatively good at lecturing, so the, the chance they give a bad morning lecture is quite low at 0.3. The bad afternoon lecture is 0.2, and the bad, the chance that they're both bad is 0.1. Okay, so uh, maybe he's much better than I am. Okay, we're asked the questions. Probability of B given A, probability of B complement given A, probability of B given A, you know, you can go through them in a moment. Okay, and we'll look at part, we'll look at these as we go along. I mean, part E is the most uh, interesting part. The probability of B given A, well, that's the probability that A and B occurs over the probability of A, okay? So we know this one, this is 0 0.1, this one is 0 0.3, so I compute the ratio and I get 1 over 3. Okay, very good. Now, I want to compute the probability of B complement given A, right? That's, I mean, there's nothing complicated about it. We're really asked that. What is this? Okay, there's nothing more than that. Now, this is an important thing to remind yourself of. Well, it's not, it's not that exciting. But this one says, I know A is occurring. What's the probability of B complement occurring? And you think, well, what is that? I don't understand what it is. Well, it's nothing different when you, don't have, when you have unconditional probabilities or standard probabilities. I know the probability of A is equal to 1 minus the probability of A complement. And it's the same when you condition. Okay, So the probability that B complement occurs, given that I know A occurred, is, is the same as 1 minus the probability of B given that A occurred. Okay, so the thing to keep in your mind or to make sure that you understand is the conditioning here, that's an A, this conditioning doesn't change, right? You're not changing that, you're just changing to the left, okay? So A is still conditioned on, but the event has gone from B complement to B in this equation, okay? The key point is I know the probability of B given A, otherwise I wouldn't have done this. And so then I have the probability of B given A, which is 0.1 over 3, so I have 1 minus 1 over 3 is just 2 over 3. Okay, very good. So now, I ask literally this part 3 is, uh, part C, excuse me, is the probability that B occurs given A complement. Okay, that's again what we're asked for. Okay, so that's the same as the probability of A complement of B over the probability of A complement. Okay, now we play the same trick as we did in that example 6. The denominator is 1 minus the probability of A. Why do I do that? Because I know the probability of A. The numerator, that's the same trick we just used here. That's the trick we just had. We know the probability of B. We know the probability of B and A. So we use that identity that we had before. Okay, so now I just substitute in the probability of A, the probability of B, and the probability of A and B. 0 0.2 minus 0 0.1 over 1 minus 0 0.3. That's 1 over 7. Okay, now I want to compute. Again, these are all just questions, sorry. These are just questions. Uh, D is I want to compute the probability of B complement given A complement. So again, I use the same trick as part B. So I know the probability of B given A complement. Okay, so the probability of B complement given A complement, again, is 1 minus the probability of B given A complement. So again, remember, please, that the conditioning set remains exactly the same, okay? I'm still conditioning on A complement occurring. I'm just going from B complement to B, okay? So the trick is the same. Of course, I'm just, here I'm doing B and B complement. Here I'm doing B complement and B, okay? What do I do, th do that again? Because I know the probability of A given B complement, okay? So I substitute in 1 minus 1 over 7, and that's 6 over 7. Okay, part E. Parties, we didn't answer that. We didn't even ask the question. So the question is the following. If the conclusion at the afternoon class, the professor is heard to mutter, what a rotten lecture, what is the probability that the morning lecture was also bad? Okay, so now I want to compute the probability of A given uh, B complement, I guess, or A given B. Is yeah, okay. So the probability of A given B that's the, the base thing is the thing here is to work out what is the event here. A is that the lecture in the morning was bad, given that the lecture in the in the evening is uh, afternoon is bad. So again, I apply uh, my 
uh, definition, the probability of A and B over the probability of B. I know these numbers. The number of A and B is uh, probability is 0 0.1. The probability of B is uh, 0 0.2. And so I get a 1 over 2. Okay, very good. So we're swiftly moving on. Uh, this is called the conditional, what is it called? The multiplication rule of probability. It's actually quite nice. Uh, it's, it's, quite good, uh, it's good that we learn this one right now. So we know, what do we know? Well, we know some things. The thing we know is from our, uh, well, how do I know this one? Okay, so let me just remind you, I want to remind you the definition, so just to make sure you remember, uh, we've seen seven examples. This equation holds in the case that the probability of A is positive. So I can multiply both sides of this equation by the probability of A, and if I do that, I get the probability of A here, and I get the probability of A and B, okay. So that's what he's doing, or we're doing, at the start of this multiplication rule slide. Okay, so that's the, that's basically just a rearrangement of the definition of the probability of uh, B given A. And if you like, A and B are sets and are exchangeable, if you like, in the definition. So I can also write this, if you like. Okay, and of course, the, these two equations at the top of the slide only hold in the scenario where the probability of A is positive and the probability of B is positive. Okay, so what does that mean? So that basically is a kind of inverse rule. If you know the conditional probability and the marginal probability, the probability of A and the probability of A given B, or the probability of B given A and the probability of B, then I can compute the, 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 condi the probability of the, both the events occur at the same time. Okay? That's kind of basically what he says here. Okay, that's another way of saying that. Well, he was going to say this is not very exciting, but in fact it's very nice. It's a very nice result because basically this can be generalized to the case where you have three sets, four sets, five sets, n sets, and that's what we're going to do now. So, this can be extended to the case of two or more sets. Okay. So, where does this come from? Okay, when well you look at this, why is this true? Why is this true? And he's saying it's true general. Basically, okay. you see in this equation, the definition, what I can do is I can replace, I can write here, C, okay, that's a set C, and I can replace by A, a and B for three arbitrary sets. Then what this thing reads as is the probability of B of C given A and B is the probability of A and B and C over the probability of A and C. Okay, you can apply that one time. You can do that again. You can apply this identity again. And that is how you derive this equation. Oops, sorry providing that the probability of A and B is positive, and the probability of A must be positive, actually, as well. Okay. It can be extended to two, more, two or more events, and the way it can be extended is simply by two applications of the definition of conditional probability. Okay. And so, in fact, you can do that n time, just as we did. You can, I mean, there's nothing to really prove. You could do it by induction if you really want to, but it's not really needed to be the case. This one, you need the probability of A to be positive because this one has to be positive, it has to exist, and you need the probability of A and B to be positive. And in general, one has the following identity. It is true that, you can prove it if you want, I can do it on the board right now if it makes you feel more happy. But nobody ever says yes, so I just uh, can say whatever I like, I suppose. So the probability of A and 1, A1, and A2, and A3, and A4, and AN, AN is finite, so this is all. The, sorry, the event that uh, an element belongs to all of the n sets simultaneously, and that can be decomposed as the probability of A1 times the probability of A2 given A1 times the probability of A3 given A1 and A2 dot 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 multiplied by the probability of An given A1 and A2 dot 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 up to An minus 1. Now, that looks like very exciting, but it's actually important because this thing will occur. This occurs, you can show this thing to stat majors. So I teach stat majors, level 3,000, 4,000. Um, 
and you show them something, there's a similar formula to this for something called random variables. And they never know it. But in fact, we, we teach you this right at the beginning. So it's very important to remember or at least be familiar with this type of equation because it, it really is a fundamental uh, identity which holds in for any collection of sets. It doesn't matter what is the underlying probabilistic type of relationship of that doesn't mean anything right now, but it will one day. And it's always true. Okay. So it's, it's important to know what it is. And again, it only holds if all of these conditional probabilities exist. Okay, so again, uh, we need the probability of A1 to be positive. We need the probability of A2, A1 and A2 to be, pos two to be positive, and so on and so forth. Okay. So let's look at an application of this formula, okay? So that's what we're going to see for the rest of uh, most of this lecture. So we, n we now have 12 shirts, and three of them are white. And two of the shirts are chosen at random. Uh, two shirts are chosen randomly, one by one without replacement. What that means is I have a shirt, I take it out, okay, I have an, I, then I put it somewhere, I go again and I take out the shirt again, okay. So that's what it means. Okay, and we're asked three questions. What is the probability that both the shirts taken out are, are white, okay? And then we're asking several other questions, which we'll, we'll, we'll study in a moment. Okay, so let's look at part A. So we define two events. A1 is the, the event that I take the shirt out, and it happens to be white. And the second event, A2, is the event that I take out another, event, uh, another shirt, and it happens to be white. So now the question is the following. So what do I want to do? I want to compute the probability of A2 and A1 occurring. Was the probability of both the shirts being picked are white. So now, the probability that I pick my first shirt being white is 3 over 12. Why is that? Well, I have three shirts. Uh, sorry, I have three white shirts and I have 12 shirts in total. So I choose one. So they're all equally likely. So I can choose any one equally likely. I close my hands, I take the shirt out. So that's uh, 3. So that's um, 3 over uh, 12. Okay, now I've already going to now I'm going to go to my second shirt. Okay, so now I suppose that the first thing that I did is I pulled out a white shirt. Okay, now I'm like trying to now to work out the probability that in the second time around I pull out a white shirt again. I'm going to work this one out. The probability that A2 occurs given A1 occurs. Now this one is quite easy again because I'm just repeating the same experiment except I know that the first time out I took out a white shirt. So now what am I left with? I've got 11 shirts, okay? And only two of them are now white. So the probability that I select a randomly, sele uh, a randomly chosen shirt, which is white, is going to be 2 over 11, because I have two white shirts, and I have 11 shirts in total. That's very funny to get shirts so many times. Okay, so what do I want to compute? I want to compute the probability of A1 and A2. That's the probability of what? Well, that's our multiplication principle in the case n is equal to 2. Okay, so I look at the formula. Uh, I take n is equal to 2, and that's just basically this first line, and I'm applying this formula. Okay, so that's equal to the probability of a1, 3 over 12, multiplied by the probability of a2 given a1, which is 2 over 11. So that's going to be 1 over 22, I guess. Okay, part A again. Part B. Uh, what is the probability that there is only one white shirt being picked? Okay, I'm only doing it twice, remember. Okay, this one is a bit more complicated, so let's think a little bit about it. Oh, it's a lot of calculations. So the probability of A1, we already established that. That's 3 over 12. The probability of A1 complement, well, we know what that is because that's 1 minus 3 over 12 is 9 over 12. We know the probability of A2. So first of all, that's what we already knew. This is just using our formula for complementation. And then this is the thing we did before. The probability of the second shirt is white, given the first one was white. That's 2 over 11. OK. Now, remember our kind of uh, axiom 2? Well, not one of our axioms kind of thing. If I condition on A1, the probability that A2 complement occurring, given A1 occurring, is simply 1 minus this probability. Okay, so again, remember, I'm fixing this thing. I fix this thing. The probability of this one occurs, given this one, 
is 1 minus the probability of the complement of this, which is this, given A1. So it's 1 minus 2, 11 is 9 over 11. Okay. So that's all very interesting. So now we're, we're getting, it's actually not a very easy question. You have to think a little bit. So if the first shirt is not white, then there are three shirts, white shirts left over from the 11 remaining shirts. So the probability that the second shirt that I take out is white, given that the first shirt was not white, well, there's 11 shirts left over, and I've got th uh, three what of them are white. So that's three over 11. Okay, now the question. Now that we've got, we've computed a lot of things, of course, um, that doesn't help us, well, it will help us solve the question. What's the question? What is the probability that there is only one white shirt being picked? So let's formulate this event in terms of A1, A2, and A1 and A2 complement. So the probability that this event occurs, so either first time round, I drew out a white shirt, and the second time around, I got something which wasn't white. Or, the first time around, I didn't get a white shirt, but the second time around, I did get a white shirt. Okay, now these two events, they're mutually exclusive. So their intersection is the empty set. So the probability of the union of these two sets is just the sum of the two probabilities. Okay, so the, this is equal to the probability of A1 and A2 intersection of this one, plus the probability of A1 complement and A2. It's important to note they're mutually exclusive, otherwise this is not a true identity. Okay, great. Now I can compute my required probability because this is equal to, by my multiplication rule, the probability of A2 complement given A1 times the probability of A1. Okay, I'm just applying simply this formula in the case N is equal to 2, except my event is now A2 and A1 complement. I forget which way around it was. A2 and A1 A2 complement A1. Okay, again, I simply apply the multiplication principle in the case where I have A1 complement and A2. A2. That's A2 given A1 complement multiplied by a probability of A1 complement. Okay, now I'm in a situation where I've computed these probabilities. In fact, the way I would solve this question, by the way, I don't think it's very intuitive, and I would start here, I would do this, I would do this, and now I would calculate these probabilities. But it so happens that we did it the other way around. Okay. So now the probability of A1, that's 3 over 12. The probability of A2 complement given A1, that's 9 over 11. The probability of A1 complement, that's equal to 9 over 12. The probability of A2 given A1 complement, 3 over 11. And so I add those two numbers together, and I get 9 over 12. Okay, very good. Okay, part C. Now, if three shirts are chosen, I'm making our life more difficult at random, what is the probability that they are all white? Okay, so we're now, other, I mean, given the fact that we're studying the multiplication principle, we're going to use the multiplication principle in this scenario, most likely where n is 3. I'm just guessing, and I don't know, actually. Okay. Okay, so A1 is the event that I get my first shirt is white. Okay, what this star is not very yeah, descriptive, but I think, uh, I guess... Uh, the thing is that basically the, fir the first shirt I draw out is white and anything else can happen it's at 2 and 3. That's what this star means. I don't care what happens here, I don't care what happens here. A2 is the event that I don't care what happens first time around, I get a white shirt, I don't care. And A3 is this thing, I don't care, I don't care, and I get a white shirt my third draw. And so what do I want to compute? I want to compute the probability that A1 occurs, and A2 occurs, and A3 occurs. The first time I, I get a white shirt, the second time I, I get a white shirt, the third time I, I get a white shirt. Multiplication principle. The probability of A1 and A2 and A3 is the probability that A3 occurs given A1 and A2. The probability of A2 given A1 times the probability of A1. It's just the formula n is equal 3. Okay, the probability A1, we know that, because we've got three white shirts, 12 shirts, the chance we take a white shirt uniformly at random is 3 over 12. A2 given A1, I've taken out a shirt, the shirt happens to be white, I've got two white shirts left over, 11 shirts in total, so the chance of that occurring is 2 over 11. And finally, uh, now the, the only difference to the question we've seen before is now I want to get a white shirt in my last 
uh, draw, right? But now I have 10 shirts left and only one of them is white, so the chance that I draw it is 1 over 10. Okay, so I multiply that out and that's 1 over 220. Okay, this is kind of an e the easiest way to compute this joint probability. Okay, so uh, example two. You have two balls uh, and they're drawn randomly, randomly drawn without replacement from an urn containing six white balls and five white black, black balls. Sorry. So you have a bucket. They have 11 balls in them. Six are white, five are black. I take one out. I take another one out. Okay, this is my experiment. And I'm doing it randomly so I can't see what's happening. Otherwise, this is a different type of question. Now we're asked the question, what is the probability that the first drawn ball is black and the second one is white? Okay, not too bad. So B1 is the event that the black ball is drawn in the first draw, and W2 represents the event that a white ball is drawn in the second draw. And he's got a strange question here. Ah, oh, yeah, the first one is black, the second one is white. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so I want to compute the probability of B1 and W2. And so again, I apply my multiplication principle. That's the probability of B1 multiplied by the probability of W2 given B1, okay? So this is a natural sequential ordering. That's why this is easier to do it this way. Now, the probability that I select a black ball in my first draw, well, I have five black balls. I have 11 balls in total. So the chance is equally likely that I choose anything. So basically the number of black balls divided by the total number of balls is five over 11. Okay, now in my second draw, now of course I only have 10 balls left in my bucket or my urn, but I have six of them are white, so the chance that I choose a white ball from my 10 remaining balls is 6 over 10. So the answer is uh, 5 over 6, uh, 5 over 11 multiplied by 6 over 10 is 3 over 11. Yeah, I didn't read, oh yeah, I did read this, yeah, sorry, it's good. Okay, example three. So two court cards are drawn in succession from an ordinary deck of 52 playing cards without re replacement. Okay, what's the probability that both cards are greater than three but less than seven? Okay, so there might be some application of this. Okay, so the idea on my 52 decks of card, um, uh, 52 cards, I draw a card from anywhere in the deck and I draw another one from anywhere in the deck and it doesn't matter, I'm equally likely to draw any card. And I want to know that both of those cards have a, a value which is 4, 5, 6, or 7, essentially. Okay? So in this case, there happen to be 16 cards greater than 3, them less than 8. Okay? So basically, I get a 4, 5, 6, or 7, but there are four different suits, uh, ace, heart, so on and so forth. Okay? So I get 4 times 4, 16 possible cards which I could draw. Okay, so now AI represents the event that the ith card drawn is gr greater than three but less than eight. Okay, oh, sorry, I'm, I just find it amusing. Sorry about that. Okay, so I want to compute the probability of A1 and A2. Okay, that's the probability that first time around I get my card which is between is four, five, six, or seven, and the next time around I also do the same. Okay, so again, the, the questions they will have a, so you want to keep it in your mind whenever you're asked this in a test or something. Basically, there's a sequential ordering here, and that's where you want to think about using this multiplication principle. So again, that's the probability of A1 and multiplied by the probability of A2 given A1. What's the probability of A1? Well, first time amount, I have 52 cards, and I have 16 cards, which are between 3 and 8. So I basically, the chance I get that is the total number of cards in my set, 16, over the total number of cards, 52. Okay, so next time out, I look at my second draw. So that's the chance now I could do the same thing, except I know that first time along, I got a card uh, which was between 4, 5, 6, and, which was 4, 5, 6, and 7. Okay, so now I have 15 of that type, and I have 51 cards left over, so I have 15 over 51 is the chance that that thing occurs. I multiply those two things together, and that's apparently 20 over 221. Okay, that's example three. Okay, example four actually is p particularly relevant. I think this is kind of useful for something. 
Um, so you're given the following information. The probability that a doctor correctly diagnoses a particular illness is 0.7. It sounds pretty bad to me. I wouldn't go to this doctor if I could. Okay. So now, given that a doctor makes the incorrect diagnosis, the chance that a patient will enter a lawsuit is 0 0.9. So this is a not, not an unreasonable thing to do, I suppose. We're asked the question, what is the probability that the doctor makes an incorrect dose uh, diagnosis and that the patient sues? Okay. Hopefully it's quite, well, for the doctor it's hopefully low, we would hope. So we introduced two events. D is the event that the uh, correct diagnosis is made and U is the event that the patient sues. So we want to compute the, the probability that the doctor makes an incorrect diagnosis and the patient sues. Okay, so I want to compute what? Well, I'm given, first of all, sorry, I'm, first of all, I'm given the probability of D, that's the probability that the doctor uh, gets the correct diagnosis, that's 0 0.7, okay. And the probability of you, the patient sues, given that the doctor got it wrong, is 0 0.9. So that's the information in the data, uh, that's the information in the question that we're provided. And I want to compute the probability that the doctor has got the incorrect diagnosis and that the patient is suing. Okay, so we know, again, from our multiplication principle, that's precisely the probability that the doctor uh, gets the wrong diagnosis multiplied by the probability that the patient sues given that they got it wrong, that that, 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 that happened. Okay. So that's equal to what? Well, this number here, I already know it. That's 0.9. That's given to me in the question. The only complication is working out the probability of D complement. Well, that's 1 minus the probability of D. So that's 1 minus 0 0.7. So that's 0.3. So it's multiplied by 0.9. Looks like about 0.27. Okay, very good. That was interesting. Okay, I didn't read this question, so okay. We delve into the unknown, I don't read this question, but we've got five minutes left, so let's at least use our time. So example five, you're given four individuals and they've re responded to a request by a blood bank for blood donations. Okay, All of them forget their blood types. This is not so unreasonable, I suppose. Suppose that only type A plus is desired and only one of the four actually has this type. Okay, If the potential donors are selected at random at random order for typing what is the uh, in a random order for typing what is the probability first of all that at least three individuals must be typed to obtain the correct type and that the third donor's blood type is a plus so let's just focus on part a okay so let's formulate the question so we're given we're, so let's introduce the event a that the first donor is not A plus and the event B that the second donor is not, donor is not A plus and so what do we know? Well we know the probability that the first donor is not A plus is 3 over 4 okay that's in the question right suppose only type A plus is desired and only one of the four actually has this type okay and the probability that the second donor is not A plus well that's uh, given that A has occurred, right? So the first one is an uh, A plus, okay? So we've, uh, we've, we've basically uh, reduced the, the, the chance. So there's only t three people left and you've got only uh, two people uh, are left over. So, hence, the, the, the set that at least three individuals are typed is identical to uh, the first two donors not being of type A+. Plus. Okay, the question is asking for this. Uh, it's at least three individuals must be typed to obtain, to obtain the desired type. So we want to get someone who's A+. Plus. Okay, so if I do at least three, that's the same as uh, the first two di donors not having A+. Plus. So okay, that means I'm going to do three or four. So the probability that at least three individuals are typed is just then equal to the probability of A occurring and B occurring. Okay, and the probability of A occurring and B occurring is again using our multiplication principle, the probability of B given A times the probability of A. Probability of B given A is two over three, the probability of A is three over four, so we get one over two. Okay, so just this example we finished because uh, we're almost out of time. Part B. 
what's the probability that this third donor is of type A plus? Okay. So the probability that the third donor is of A plus is the probability that the first donor isn't A plus multiplied by the probability that the second donor isn't A plus given the first donor isn't A plus multiplied by the probability that the third donor is A plus given that the first two are not A plus. Okay, okay so you see what we're doing here. Okay, we've we got this one here, we've got this one here. That's just A1, this is A2 given A1. So now we know that the first two donors are not A+. plus. I've only got two possible donors left, and one of them is A+. plus. So the probability of this one is 1 over 2. This one is from this one. This one comes from the first question. This comes from the first question. So I multiply these three numbers together, and I'm going to get 1 over 4. Okay? That's just a pl an application of the multiplication rule. Okay, very good. So... Uh, there's no point in me teaching you 1.6.4 today, so uh, that's the end of today's lecture. I'll see you on uh, Thursday in LT26. Uh, don't forget the tutorials will start next week. If you're not assigned to a tutorial, you can email me, or if you want to change your tutorial, please email me, hopefully by the end of the day, and I can change you. Your tutorial, only T1 to T15 is uh, going to be used, but they all have space in them, so if you want to move around, it's not a problem, just let us know. Thanks very much for your attention.